Hi, everybody. Art Van den Enden here. Uh, welcome to our third town hall of the of the early spring season for 2024. Uh, I am actually coming to you from a garden center in Toronto called the Toronto Plant Market. So really exciting for me to be here because because they're getting ready for their grand opening in a couple of days or at the end of this week. So many garden centers that are seasonal centers are in the same position right now. And we've been battling with this yo-yo. Uh, yo -yo yo -yo. But uh, you know what? Spring's, spring is here. We're on our way. I see beautiful flowering um, ephemeral plants all around me and uh, I'm excited for them to get their season started. So again, thanks everybody for being here. We, uh, we're going to get started. I want to introduce George Avari. He is a, um, a long careered expert in our industry. Uh, he is, uh, he has been a, a business owner as well as a business coach for many years. And, you know, I was particularly interested in inviting George to join us because, you know, George, your, your, your primary background is construction and installation and maintenance. You know, I, I think sometimes we forget in the garden center sector that so many of our businesses also run installation and maintenance crews. So, your expertise, I think you're going to hit a really interested target market. So with that, um, I'm going to shut up. I'm going to hand it over to you and listen intently. So welcome, George. Oh, thanks so much, Art. That's, that's awesome. Um, I guess uh, I guess I got to get the uh, thing to bop over to the to the PowerPoint for everybody. And uh, then I can I can start. While okay. we're doing okay. that, a little background for everybody. So um, I've had a, a construction business, like for house construction, landscape business, property maintenance. We just bought a property maintenance business. I also had a wholesale nursery business. So I've got the sort of gambit of, of, um, of experience, made lots of mistakes. Um, and... Uh, and so I can share some of my wisdom with you uh, and hopefully help you avoid the pitfalls that I did. Uh, it is a difficult business we're in. We've got Mother Nature against us. Uh, we've got seasonal peaks in demand. Uh, we've got crazy customers. <laughs> we've got crazy employees who love plants. So it really is an interesting sort of um, mix of things. And to navigate it successfully requires some, some strategy and some craftiness. And so Today's presentation hopefully is going to highlight some of those things, but from a financial prism. Here we go. So essentially, this, this presentation is about financial soundness in the garden center slash nursery slash hybrid business. And um, the question is, at a high level, what does a great garden center look like? And so there's lots of different models, lots of different ways people do things. I've had the luxury of buying from a lot of your of your businesses over the years. So you get the sort of landscaper perspective on what we look for um, on, on sort of the service component piece. Uh, but really it does come down to actually how you run your business, great financials, a great balance sheet, high inventory turnover, um, low loss rates and consistent healthy net profits. And um so that's 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 tough to do, uh, but some of the things are in our control and some of them aren't. So, for example, great financials, they are absolutely in your control. What's interesting is your financials for your garden center business look different than your financials for your landscaping business. In your landscape business, you generally want to put the staff into cost of goods sold. And in the nursery business, you want to put them in overhead because you can't you can't allocate, you know, a, a person to a job because it's like you're selling a whole bunch of plants. So the way you set up your financials has a huge impact on how you read your financials and how you understand your gross profits uh, amongst the different types of businesses. So um, 
interestingly enough, th this has been my experience. So I've probably seen directly and indirectly a thousand businesses financials for sure. And I would say less than 1% of them are well done. And I can tell you the companies that don't have great financials all do poorly. The ones that are mediocre struggle and the ones that have great financials tend to do really well. So, you know, if you want to get money from a bank, if you want to understand how to manage your cash flow, all those things, you have to have great books. So that's a function of getting a great accountant or somebody who understands the chart of accounts and set your books up properly um, so that it's really easy to understand. And I'll show you some quick snapshot samples of compressed income statements because they're usually very long um, that will help you understand what clean looks like. What am I looking for? So one of the uh, secrets to successful finance is actually budgeting properly. So what happens is you get an income statement. Hopefully it's clean and organized and orderly. Um, from that, you create a budget or in other words, a forecast, which is predicting what do you think is going to happen this year? Are sales going to be up? Are sales going to be down? Is the season going to be longer, shorter, El Nino, El Nina? Um, you know, um, is there a bug that wiped out half of our inventory? What, whatever it is, you've got to come up with a budget. And then from that budget, you're going to drive your pricing system. Now in landscape construction, it's essentially labor, materials, equipment, and subcontractors where you're going to appropriate overhead and profit based on your budget. In the nursery business, it's different. What am I going to charge each plant out at? And that's an interesting question. So we'll dive into that a little bit later. How do I, how do I charge the right amount for each plant so I hit my sales goal and have a great um, income statement? So, uh, and, and the idea is that you sort of repeat this process. Now, this P&L budgeting system it would be a little bit different for the nursery business because um, you're not actually doing an estimate. You're just actually setting a price for everything. In landscaping, there's even more of a risk because um, you have to do an estimate. And if you're wrong, you lose money, which means that you don't hit your sales goal, which means your income statement is worse. And then you got to fix it at an estimating level. Um, for the nursery business, more focused on pricing. Like how do I set the right price for my plants to achieve my sales goal? So uh, budgeting uh, price strategy, what do I need to charge? So there's a couple of ways. One is follow the leader, right? One is risk pricing, see what the market will bear. Now I've tried that before where I just raise the price to see what happens and uh, yeah, it can work, believe it or not. So I've gone through all of these things here. There essentially we go. What I, you guys yeah. can see, cool. yeah. essentially, essentially most people's books are a disaster and so they need to be fixed. Um, and the companies that have great financials generally do really well. So I'll skip this. This was the budgeting discussion I had where your income statement is what happened and the budget is what you think is going to happen. And that's where you figure out how to price things. Quick recap. So there's different strategies. Follow the leader. Risk pricing. See what the market will bear. So I've done that before where I just like, well, we'll see what happens. I'll raise my price. Uh, ironically, I didn't go out of business and I started making lots of money. So that was kind of... <laughs> Not the best way to go about it. Uh, averaged out pricing. So you can bring down the high ticket item prices if that's an issue and you raise the prices on lower uh, priced per uh, merchandise. You can do a quality scarcity premium pricing. So things that you have that are really special, you can have a premium price for. Um, a great example of that it used to be uh, PAO and I think Verbanzix today does that where they they tag and bring in the best stuff and just charge a premium and all of this stuff's very similar. Um, you know, the brand structures are better and uh, they command a premium. Seasonal peaks and valley pricing. So obviously you can jack the price up in the spring, maybe lower the price in the fall. Um, you also may wanna consider um, keeping your prices high the whole season and buying a little smarter so you're not carrying dogs that people don't want. And then hybrid pricing, where you essentially have a, a melange of strategies. So you can mix and match your different strategies and, uh, and come up with the best um, overall outcome for sales. So, and then you can have high volume blow up pricing. So this is something that the chains like to do. Um, there was a, a company in Toronto that used to do uh, high-end planting. And what they would do literally is every uh, 
October, they would take all their inventory and just cut it in half price and get it out because the cost of handling uh, and the risk of plants depreciating over the winter was so high that he'd rather just take the hit. And he probably bought it for $100 and sold it for $100 rather having to handle it and then get rid of the stuff that died. He just cleared everything out. So there's different strategies that you can take to achieve your, um, your best pricing uh, methods. And you can do subsidized pricing. So one of the things that you can do if you own properties, you can lease to tenants, for example, that reduces your, um, your increases your revenue and reduces your costs. Other services like landscaping and snow plowing can also augment uh, the income. One of the big dilemmas in the nursery business is it's a very seasonal business. So you have massive peaks of demand and then it dies off. And so that's that's really tough. Um, so you essentially have to make uh, money in, you know, seven to eight months. And probably most of that is in three months. So it's enormous stress on the people, the management, the employees, on the materials, on the machines. Everything is just getting um, leveraged. So things like uh, having tenants, if you have a big enough property that even buy from you, um, are a wonderful way to round out your income. So chart of accounts. This is super simple. So um, there's a, a principle called GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles. And um, essentially all sales start with a 4,000 series account. You never should put anything into that 4,000 series account. Be like 4,010, say nursery sales, 4,020, landscape sales, 4,030, tree uh, removal sales, whatever it is. Um, you kind of want to break your incomes down this income statement down with uh, this numbering system. It'll help you track um, where your money's going and what divisions are doing better or worse than others, which ones have higher margins, which ones have more labor attributed to them, which ones have more headaches. So um, the next one is your cost of goods sold. And in the nursery business, that's the product that, uh, that, we, that we sell. And hopefully we buy well and sell well. And that's the magic in terms of um, making money in the nursery business. So leftover floor inventory is not income. So in um, essentially your inventory is a problem. It's uh, not only do you have to manage it, not only does it take money out of your out of your business. Fortunately in the nursery business, I believe you don't have to pay income tax on your, on your inventory. Um, if um, in the landscaping business, if we buy inventory to stock for our work, we have to, it's considered income if we're using our profits to buy it. So we can't expense it. So at least in the nursery business, you've got that bonus. And then you can leverage that with your landscape business, obviously, to help each business. If you have a landscape or a plant installation business, it's a great way to play around with the money a bit. So then you get what's your gross profit. So that's sales minus COGS. So your gross profit essentially measures um, how efficient and productive you are at doing the work. Um, then you have your overhead. The overhead is required to administer the work to make sure that, um, you know, you buy the right things, you uh, have the right staff working, you have the right POS system, you, um, you know, you have the, 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 the right equipment, all those things are managed in your overhead. Um, and that is a necessary expense. Your gross profit, again, tells you how efficient you are. And your overhead essentially is what's required to make you efficient from an administrative perspective and an operations perspective. Um, you can have a high gross profit and a very high overhead and make a very low net profit. So you have no money left. Um, the trick is to not grow the overhead um, and generally invest in, in technology, uh, equipment, systems, to reduce the number of people, otherwise you get what's called top heavy. So um, labor to produce and sell the work, equipment to produce and sell the work, administrative labor to support the work, finance, insurance, law, postal and fines, operational facilities, human resources and technology. So those are generally the inputs that go into overhead. They're all necessary. And uh, the people part is the part that usually blows this thing out of control where you start having assistance and multiple layers of inefficiency in terms of the bureaucracy. So the trick is to get a really good income statement 
and then you end up with a net profit. Now, if you do this poorly, so in other words, you buy poorly and you sell poorly and you manage poorly, you're going to end up with a very big loss. And so this is an art. There's a science and an art to this. Uh, and management and leadership is probably the one thing that doesn't show up on the income statement. But usually I can see the companies that do better um, have great leaders. And the leadership is actually not something that you're born with. You can learn leadership. I'll give you a quick example. So when you make a decision, I like to use decision trees. So if then logic. Um, if this happens, then what happens? And then what's the consequence of that happening? And if this happens, what, what happens? So I like to usually use pros, cons, and unintended consequences. So any decision you're going to make, which is financial, uh, what are the pros, what are the cons, and what are the unintended consequences? And if you use that as an exercise to, at the macro level and the micro level, make your decisions, you'll make way fewer mistakes. Um, and that's that's essentially logic, formal logic. So the balance sheet, the balance sheet is your assets. So what do you own? Um, the balance sheet is organized by quality. So cash is obviously number one. I can do whatever I want with that. Receivables is next. Of course, the quality of receivables, if they're over 90 days, they're not great. The inventory quality, the turnover quality, um, the resellability of the inventory, all those things affect your balance sheet. Now, for a nursery, if you own a farm, your farm, the trees on your farm are not measured on your balance sheet. Until they're out of the ground and harvested, they have no value. So that's food for thought. Um, vehicles and equipment, tools and furniture, real estate. Obviously, some of you have nurseries that own the property. It may be ironic that your actual net worth is um, tied up in the property, um, which you can leverage for loans if you needed to. Um, or you can sell it, or you can do all kinds of things. But if you've got a quality piece of real estate in a quality location, it's going to appreciate with no effort. So for the, those of you that have great real estate holdings, awesome. That's that's a quality piece in your balance sheet. Um, stocks and bonds. Some of you may have stocks and bonds where if you have extra cash, you can actually buy short-term bonds and then use your line of credit to finance little dips in your cash flow. Um, but make interest on the balance of the money in the midterm. So you can really leverage your balance sheet to do some amazing things if you know how to do it, but always do it within the prism of safety. So we don't want to over leverage the balance sheet. I see companies with enormous debt and um, and it's terrifying for me to see that. So uh, my favorite analogy for safety in business is imagine that I'm going to ask you to cross the desert with a jug of water, actually three jugs of water, and you've got to juggle them. Now, um, the, the jars are different qualities. Some are really thick glass and some are really thin glass. And you've got to get from one side of the desert to the other. Um, and on the way, you may also see a um, an oasis. So you've got to stay focused and avoid the oasis because there may be nothing there. You've got to make sure when you're juggling the glass, you don't drop the weakest vessel, right? And you got to make sure you don't drink all the water at once and run because you won't make it across the desert. So when you grow your business, the trick is to go at the right speed, drink at the right rate, avoid the temptations, right? And uh, maybe rest during the uh, during the evening uh, or sorry, during the heat of the day and then walk at night and you'll make it to the other side. And most businesses, they die on cash flow. Um, they make really poor investment decisions and their timing is just a disaster. So that's the best advice I can give you in terms of the balance sheet. How do you understand that? Goodwill is what your business is worth. So the goodwill could be the real estate value. It could be the fact that you've got a turnkey business. It has profits every single year. Uh, you know, there's low turnover. The culture is great. The leadership's great. The financial's great. The administration's great. That's goodwill. Most small businesses have literally no goodwill. So we buy and sell businesses uh, at Oriel and we help our clients do the same thing. So the value that you're going to get of your business is a function of what your financials look like. And so you want to have some really, really good looking financials. Um, and we also look at the quality of the financials, right? So just because your numbers say uh, it's a good thing, well, your inventory might suck and your receivables might be terrible. And your property might be having, you know, an underground oil tank on it, right? 
So, you know, it may look good at first, but after investigation, you find actually it's not that pretty. So the trick is to have a quality balance sheet. Liabilities are what you owe, and these are the risks to the business. And essentially, there's your current liabilities, credit facilities, accrued liabilities, deposits, payroll tax, things like that, um, vacation pay, long-term real estate debts, which, which is a good, good thing if you've got a good property, but your interest rates aren't killing you. Long-term loans, leases, uh, vehicles, and equipment. Again, if you've got a good fleet, there's good fleets and ugly fleets, and it makes a big difference on your on your balance sheet. So for those of you that have 20-year-old trucks, they may be working for you, but they're not helping your balance sheet. And so there's, there's a trade-off between um, being cautious and also actually making money on your assets, like selling your trucks for a premium. So one of the things we do at Oriole is we have a specific fleet rotation schedule that allows us to profit from buying and selling our equipment. So imagine you're a dealership. Uh, you're, you're essentially a, a vehicle and equipment dealership. You just don't know it. So you can do that either well, or you can do that poorly. If you do it well, you'll actually have to pay tax on gain of sale of asset, which is a great thing. So uh, there's long-term shareholder loans. And, uh, and then you have equity, which is essentially the difference between your assets and liability. What am I worth? But what you're worth is also a function of the quality of the assets and the risks of the liabilities. So just because I said the number looks good down here in the equity section, doesn't mean that you have a great balance sheet. So we really need to do some deep dives. We can look at businesses to see what's going on. So your net worth a specific moment time. So the difference between an income statement is how much money do I make a year? And your balance sheet is how much money have I accumulated to date in my lifetime of business? That's, that's the difference. Um, most people don't look at the balance sheet. It usually is only updated about once or twice a year, but it's very important. It tells the tale of which direction is my business going. Am I getting richer or I'm getting, am I getting poorer? You know, how much you make doesn't necessarily make you rich. If you blow all the money, you have nothing left over. The balance sheet shows us, hey, what's left over? And, you know, how does this show up? Does it show up in cash? Does it show up in goodwill? You know, hopefully you have an awesome all of the above on the assets piece. So, oops, um, income statement transfers. So from your income statement, there are some um, transactions that do transfer to the balance sheet. And so essentially when your year end is done, your uh, net income, your cash will increase, obviously, if you were profitable. So that goes to your balance sheet. So there is a relationship between the balance sheet and the income statement. It's not something you generally need to worry about. But if you're making a lot of profit and you've got a lot of cash, um, it's going to help your balance sheet. Uh, if you're buying your equipment smartly and selling it smartly, it's going to help your balance sheet. If you're paying off your mortgage, it's going to help your balance sheet. So those are the the, the essentially the the distinctions between the income statement and the balance sheet. Depreciation is something else that also shows up on your balance sheet. Obviously, if something goes down, the, the value of a truck. One of the mistakes that many people do is when they price equipment, they rely on depreciation. The problem is with, with that is that if there's inflation, it's actually depreciation plus inflation, which is what you need to factor for to recover your costs. So, um, you know, if you get this right, then you know the math and it doesn't lie. The math doesn't lie. You can actually get to a really good outcome and understand why, when, how, um, and, and that'll determine a successful outcome for you in terms of financial management for your business. The goal for all of you eventually is either to hand the business over to your kids or to retire and sell the business. So you got to get all these things right. And getting your financials right is a function of getting a correct chart of accounts set up really well, training your bookkeeper on that chart of accounts correctly, and then having a great accountant. Um, so amortization obviously is your uh, mortgage uh, and that's spread out over time. Working capital. So this is how much money I have to play around with to do different things. You can either do it um, uh, out of ca uh, cash flow or you can do it out of uh, shareholders loans or bank loans. There's all kinds of things you can do for working capital. Um, but the more working capital you have, the easier it is to run your business because you're like, I can't make payroll. This is going to be difficult. Or I can't buy this piece of equipment because I'm too scared because I don't have enough money. So once you get good working capital, um, your cash flow is better and life is a lot easier.
So uh, an example of cash flow would be, let's say you're in the airline business and I sold the tickets in advance. I get your money in advance and I don't have to deliver the service till after. I'm going to have some great working capital. My cash position is going to be great. I can actually lose money for many, many years before my cash flow catches up to the losses. In the nursery business, it doesn't work like that. You got to put the money out for the inventory first and then collect the money. Some of the money is collected in 30 days and it's like people like me buying from you. So it's a very difficult cash flow business. It's the opposite of an airline. Uh, and then there's equity shareholders value increases uh, as a function of, of the balance between your, um, your assets and your liability. So the goal is to increase the shareholder value and uh, then you can take dividends because you're profitable. So the frequency generally is biannual or annual, um, and it just needs to be updated. Uh, so it's, it's not a constant thing from an accounting perspective. Uh, and that's essentially the distinction between the income statement, the balance sheet, and how the things from the income statement transfer to the balance sheet. So I know I'm going quickly. It's a lot to go over. Uh, but this is how well you should know your finances. Um, so it, it'll make a huge difference in, in you being a better business person. So inventory, cash flow management, opportunity risk. So who is your customer and who are you competing against? Um, do they pay on time? Do they even pay you? Do you have people that don't pay you? Like that's a huge risk. Um, so, you know, if I had somebody that I was nervous about, I'd make them pay with a credit card. I would not take the risk of uh, lending them credit. Um, it's terrifying when you actually see people's financials that the world goes <laughs> around with people uh extending credit. There's also the intention of the person, whether they have honorable intentions or not, right? So an honorable person will literally kill themselves to make sure you get paid. Some people actually leverage suppliers and take advantage of them. It's terrible to see. Carry less variety, right? So one of the things I see in nurseries, I see way too many different varieties. Um, so who's your customer? You know, uh, they can always pick that other thing up at the other nursery if they have to. You can't be all things to all people. That's one way to help your business. Better quality, larger sizes. Um, again, the people with money want better quality and larger sizes. And then uh, other non-perishable goods like mulch, gravel, natural stone. The good news is they appreciate over time. Generally, your plants, once they're out of the ground, if they overwinter, uh, big problems with them um, coming back and, uh, and adding value to your business. And the cost just goes up. So... There's the Costco mentality, uh, run out. So essentially they carry stuff until it runs out. So if you bought less but sold out, that might be a better strategy than buying more, thinking you're going to get marginal sales when the sales are going down in July and August and being stuck with inventory, then not knowing what to do with it, either throwing it out or um, having to restock it. So uh, that's a serious concern. You can raise the prices in July and August. So when Home Depot... Uh, and Art mentioned this to me, which is a good one, runs out of stock, uh, you can keep your prices high in July and August because everybody still needs that stuff. The question is, what's the quality like? So I think in the nursery business, quality, everybody wants quality. They always pick through the good stuff first. So sell less with a higher quality and, and maybe a larger margin. The other strategy is to dump all your inventory in the fall. Just have a clear out. Um, I'm not sure how that strategy works in retail. It might be not great because then people will wait for the sale. Um, so I would say, I would argue in wholesale, maybe it works. But in retail, maybe what you want to do is buy smarter and have less inventory and like throw it out. Don't even like dump it on the market at a low price. So discounts, um, inventory carryover is an issue, pros and cons. Um, well, some things probably overwinter well. Maybe you want to make a list of what those things are and it's worth it. But you also have to build that into your cost for that for that item and not let the entire nursery carry the cost of the stuff that you're restocking uh, and winterizing and bringing out uh, and all of those things. So uh, purchase terms with vendors. So uh, again, when you buy, I know some of you barter back and forth between nurseries. That's kind of cool. Um, there is... Um, I don't know what your terms are, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, I don't know. But obviously you're in a in a high cash output business and a slow input on the revenue side. Um, so that's something that for sure uh, could get some more exploration. So accounting, bookkeeping, and tax partners. Are the correct entries going to the correct accounts? 
probably in the nursery business it's a little bit easier but in the landscape business it's an absolute disaster one of the things that we find is people use the word miscellaneous or um uh or general and then everything gets thrown there because the bookkeeper doesn't know and you end up with not knowing where your money's going and then you can't fix the business because you don't know what to fix and whether it was an expense or a cost it's a bit of a disaster so clean books are huge uh, is the information being processed in a timely manner so if you're not keeping your books up to date it becomes a nightmare it's just like a hoarding pile of paper in your in your um in your in your office there's new technologies where you can take pictures of slips and it automatically goes into QuickBooks. I think one is called Dext and the other one is called, uh, I forgot the name of it, but they're fantastic. We use those all the time. We just essentially don't have paper anymore. It's fantastic. Um, um, are all the expenses and cost slips being recorded? So missing slips is a bit of a disaster. Again, that's where taking a photo of them in real time right away is good and then throw the slip away. So um, these, these new uh, technologies are really a game changer. Do you have a good bookkeeper or accountant? So most bookkeepers aren't great and most accountants are tax accountants. They're interested in taxes. And that's why I see terrible charts of accounts. Like an accountant that cared would say, hey, your books are messed up. Let's organize them properly and make sense of this. Uh, but some of it's also industry um, experience. They don't understand the industry. So you wanna get somebody uh, who understands the books in the industry that you're working and that they and they love it. Because if you get somebody who's doing, I don't know, manufacturing, uh, it's totally different than landscape construction versus a nursery. And the books are set up differently. So it's very important to, um, to have a great accountant. Uh, we do, uh, we help with people's books to set them up correctly. Um, and, uh, and it makes a big difference uh, moving forward. So you understand what's going where and when. Um, is payroll done properly and on time? Uh, one of the tips I can give with payroll is you can, uh, with vacation pay, sorry, is put the vacation pay on every single payroll. Don't distribute it out at the end of the year. And the reason for that is you have all the employees coming to you at different times and interrupting your bookkeeper, your controller, uh, when it could just be handled automatically. So you're going to have a cash flow issue uh, one way or another, either later or up front. Uh, it's just way less administration. So less administration is a better way to go. Um, that was the vacation. Is your HST being submitted on time? So that's a big issue for a lot of businesses. Um, they don't get submitted on time. Then they pay uh, fines and penalties. So that should be handled properly. Um, are you getting monthly reporting? So for example, what were my sales last year in March compared to this year in March? What changed? Was it the weather? Did we buy poorly? What happened? Maybe March is a bad example, maybe May. But we want to know what our goals are for every single month and to see whether we're ahead or behind. And it would be even interesting to understand uh, what impact the weather has on the shifts in our income. So you'd have sort of an income uh, analysis from a weather perspective, right? We had an early spring, we had a late spring, we had an early fall, we had a late fall. How did that impact our sales? What can we do to counter that? Um, so that's out of your control to some degree, but if you're on top of it, you can probably do something about it. Uh, are your taxes paid on time? So your uh, federal taxes, uh, the government likes to take their pound of flesh. Uh, once you start making money, they want regular contributions. Again, it's another burden for a for a, a maintenance, uh, for a nursery business, because you're not like the airlines, you collect the money in advance. And what is the cost of your bookkeeping as a percent of sales uh, and in dollars? So what does it actually cost to keep good books? Um, there is a ratio to sales. Uh, obviously, the bigger your business, it's not directly proportional, but uh, it might be a consideration to get another company, if you're not good at it, to do that for you, because it has to be done, and it has to be done right. And neglecting it is just going to cost you enormous sums of money down the pipe. When you go to your bank and you need to borrow money, and you have hopeless books, they're almost laughing at you. So that can all be sorted out for sure. What is the cost of poor bookkeeping? Uh, well, it's not collecting money. It's uh, getting fines, paying too much interest. It's wasting money that you didn't even know you were wasting. Um, it's not knowing what's going on. It's not being able to predict the future. It literally is the fulcrum of um, success is great books. So automation, obviously, now we have automatic bank statements, things like going into your, into your, uh, 
uh, QuickBooks. Um, so it's getting easier and easier. But if your books are sloppy, if the architecture is sloppy, the analogy would be you have a uh, house and the kitchen is in the back corner of the house. Uh, it doesn't make sense. You have to go through the bedrooms to bring the groceries to the to the kitchen. Uh, usually kitchens are in the center of the house or off the center back of the house. And um, it's much more efficient with a mudroom. You come through the garage, bring your groceries in. Well, it's the same metaphor for your books. You have sloppy books. Is it ugly and inefficient or is it super clean and efficient? So equipment, one of the questions was about equipment purchasing or leasing and depreciation. So leasing helps cash flow, but it's more expensive. Um, and the reason for that is that you're essentially paying interest on the entire amount, even though uh, it looks like your payments are less. Whereas if you're doing financing, each month you pay down your finance, you're paying down the principal as well as the interest. Whereas on a lease, you're continually paying the interest. Another distinction between some of the leases are, some of the leases, um, there's what's called the declining balance or, uh, interest. And there's also when you're just paying a fixed interest rate. So you're paying the full interest rate on the full amount the full time, as opposed to having the um, amount of interest you're paying decrease. So leasing is great for cash flow if you're growing, but some people lean on it way too hard. And then whether you should buy the equipment out is another issue. And then there's what's called operating and capital leases. So uh, an operating lease is you pay the, pay the monthly uh, uh, amount and then you hand the machine back and get another one. Um, not great for your balance sheet. And if you have a great fleet rotation schedule, it's not a great strategy. I've gone into businesses that are over $10 million and their equity in the business is like $300,000 for a $10 million business. Uh, that, that, that equity ratio is terrible. Um, so what we want to do is we want to try and the balance sheet, build the balance sheet uh, as part of what we're doing. So your leasing strategy or finance strategy has to be tied to that. So it's not just about how much money your business produces as income. It's about how well we pad the balance sheet as a function of our decision making. Leasing companies take the capital risk. So if you're leasing, it's their problem. If something happens, it helps open up uh, money for borrowing from banks if you need to. Uh, when you borrow from banks, they own you and your firstborn, your home, everything. So um, there's an advantage from a risk perspective to lease because it's on their balance sheet. It's not on your balance sheet. Um, financing hinders your ability to borrow more uh, for other things, which I mentioned earlier. And smart financing equals a better balance sheet. So if I was to spend, say, four or five years working with a company, and I said, let's grow your balance sheet, not grow your business, but grow your balance sheet, you're going to get a lot richer. And so the, the mix of financing for cash flow, uh, the mix for, um, for uh, leasing, it's all a blend to get to a better balance sheet, essentially. Is, that's the way I see it. And to help your cash flow. You need a great fleet rotation schedule. So if you know the, 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 the best analogy I can give you is the age of the asset over the hours or mileage, there's a sweet spot there where you can get the most money for it while you miss all the repairs. And you don't see the repairs, generally speaking, uh, that clearly. Uh, and they hit you like a ton of bricks after four or five years, depending on the mileage and the age. In some cases, for things like cranes, it's hours. So you may have low mileage on a crane truck, but the crane's running, the, the engine's running to run the crane, and you have high hours. And most people don't know that, actually, when they buy crane trucks. So that's an interesting distinction. So all of these things will impact when you should buy and when you should sell. Don't think, because I own it, I'm going to make more money. That's a mistake. As a matter of fact, your balance sheet is actually getting weaker. Um, so there's a sweet spot there where you get the best life of the vehicle and somebody else buys it with some life left in it that maybe isn't as wise or maybe um, is a secondary piece of equipment. I didn't say don't buy used. I'm just saying consider when you're buying used. Uh, and, and you want to unload it before it costs you a headache and you get very little money for it. It also helps your liquidity. So if you've got like really great vehicles and assets and you want to sell it, it's very easy to raise cash to, uh, to finance something else if you don't need it. Um, or something happens, you need to downsize. If you have rusty old stuff, 
uh, you know, it, it's also bad branding for your business. Um, and it's going to keep your maintenance repair costs down. And it also is going to help lower your appreciation. And if you do it well, you'll have to pay lots of tax on uh, flipping your assets. So that's the goal. You are a dealership as well. You just don't realize it. You're a, a, an equipment and vehicle dealership as a business. You just don't know it. If you do this right, uh, you will you will start making money um, in a separate holding company eventually that holds all the assets and you'll have so much money you don't want it. You won't know what to do with it. That's the goal. So again, this is all part of the financial structuring and understanding how money really works. Um, so eventually, when you get to the right state and you do this properly, you're going to be able to self-finance. You're going to pay cash for equipment, right? Uh, and you'll have a separate ROI account, which is going to allow you to be your own investor. So instead of paying the bank interest, you will be your own banker and you will keep that money as profit for yourself as well. And um, so equipment purchase or lease, it's a hybrid of the two. Eventually, you want to be self-financing. Uh, and you can probably get there in five years if you go on a plan to improve your business and understand uh, what it is that I need to fix first. What should I dump? How do I raise cash? What should I invest in? What should I buy? What shouldn't I buy? Um, and uh, and so there's quite a bit to this. Uh, so labor planning and forecasting. What should the rage rate be? Well, that's based on a number of things. It's based on your um, ability to pay, right? Based on your budget, like what can we afford? Um, it depends on the level of experience of staff that you need. Uh, I would rather uh, have a lower profit and lower turnover with more consistent, less headache staff than try and squeeze profits out and have HR nightmares and volatility. So if you're going to lose one or 2% on profit, but your grief goes through the roof because your staff are unreliable, it's not a very worthy trade-off. Life is too short to have that kind of stress. People are assets or liabilities. So if you've got a great asset, it shows up every day. It's phenomenal, uh, and I think that's 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 one of the one of the challenges in your industry in the nursery business is you've got these peaks of um, peaks of demand from customers, and so you have to hire all these transitional uh, employees. Well, if you've got students and you can get them to come back every single year, maybe you offer them a signing bonus and you build that into your budget to come back as part of their compensation. Because it's great having great um, salespeople. I used to work at a, a company called um, Collegiate Sports, and I was their top salesman. Uh, I think I was paid four fifty an hour at the time. I think I asked for a fifty cent raise, and they wouldn't give it to me. And I outsold everybody three to one. Well, I don't think that's very wise of them to not give me a raise, but they had their budgets, and they didn't see, um, I guess, the nuances of who's worth more. So, you know, you obviously should probably have a career plan uh, and have a career path and, a, and, a, and, a, and an income, a, a chart that essentially shows the different wages that you make at different levels of, of um, expertise in whatever role that you're playing. Because then that reduces the friction among the employees and also gets them to understand uh, what the next steps are and why they should come back. Um, so that's a huge part of, of your budgeting. Like, how do I plan my labor? What age are the staff? Will they get injured? Uh, what will your what will your budget afford? I mentioned that earlier. So when I talk about injury, uh, you know, we made the mistake of hiring uh, some people that were, let's say, 100 pounds soaking wet. And, uh, you know, you could just tell they weren't built for landscaping. Um, so I'm also cognizant of um, who I'm hiring. Doesn't matter whether it's male or female, but... I can tell, you know, one of my first questions is, uh, you know, where did you grow up? And if they say I grew up on a farm, well, that's a great reference right there because they get up early. Mom and dad were hard on them. And uh, and essentially they have enormous discipline. Right. So that's all part of your labor planning, not just how much, but who and how do I attract that great talent? Maybe I have a, a bonus structure to bring their friends or whatever it is, all the other farm kids. <clears throat> So receivables, how best to get paid. Visa, MasterCard, American Express. I'm not a big fan of American Express. They charge high fees. Most people that have an American Express have a Visa and a MasterCard. Um, so I force them to go to Visa or MasterCard. Uh, credit card fees um, suck, obviously. But that's probably one of the things that you need to build into your system to make sure you do get paid. Charge accounts. 
again, be very wary of those uh, companies that are fly by night companies or people that are um, of low character. Cash obviously is an issue because you know your staff may pocket the cash. I would try and move away from cash. And then again, what's your bad debt ratio, right? So especially on the charge accounts, what's the chance of me not getting paid? Inventory, uh, carryover, pros and cons. So, um, you know, you can write things off. Maybe it's better just to write stuff off than handle it from a cash uh, receivables perspective. And purchase terms with vendors. Uh, I know some companies do bartering. I think I mentioned that earlier. Leverage lines of credit for cash flow cycles. That's not a bad strategy. As long as you just dip into it occasionally, and most of your good cash flow is in a bond that's collecting money that, that exceeds your fees. So payables, uh, what are the best supplier terms? Barter, pay with credit card, pay, pay, uh, payment terms with vendors. I, I'm not sure how you guys do that, but that'd be an interesting thing to, to find more out about, whether it's 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, how that works, whether you can return inventory you don't use, I don't know. Um, KPIs, your warranty, right? You have enormous warranty in the nursery business. I figure out what's dying, when, and why, and try and reduce it. There's a KPI. Um, pests, light, and water. Like what's not doing well in certain conditions. That's simple operations, but it's a KPI. Control inventory and restocking. What are we restocking and how often? What's a hot seller of you, right? Well, we should get more of that. Uh, high margin items that sell well. So maybe that Japanese maple that is just a beautiful branch structure. Maybe you spend more time flying out to British Columbia and picking plants yourself to make sure that your quality is higher and your quantity is lower. I know when we used to do that, it was a race. We've got 10 minutes. It was a race to, to fly out to beat the other nurseries to tag the best material with uh, locking tags with Oriole on it. Um, so... Uh, manage your bad debt ratio, right? So, you know, what's your bad debt? Where's it coming from and why? And obviously you want to eliminate bad debt. How do we do that? That just kills. You bought all this stuff, you sold it, you didn't get paid, right? That's something we, we definitely want to manage. Measure revenue per service employee, right? How many employees do I have to hire to produce X amount of work? Measure the ratio of labor to sales, right? What's my percentage of labor to, to the revenue? Identify revenue per square foot. So what area is making me more money if I have a small nursery? Uh, every inch is sacred. We want to figure out what's making me money and what's not. And maybe shrink areas or expand areas, get tenants, whatever it is you've got to do to leverage every inch of your property. And then monthly sales year over year. And the ratio of material cost to sales. So these are a bunch of KPIs that you want to know. And then measure your inventory turnover. That's a huge one. Gross profit control, sell for a higher price, pay less, buy bulk with high turnover, don't try and sell everything and buy less and sell what others don't. So there's a bit of magic there. There's a, a bit of creative nuance for you guys. Um, there might be some experimentation there where you you didn't know what you didn't know and you found out, but there might be a little bit of that strategy mixed into, uh, into your mix of, of uh, trying to get the most out of your nursery. So, um, most a great a great uh I checked this up on Chat GBT. A great nursery can make a 30 to 32 percent gross profit, and some really bad ones lose terribly. Like it's just a nightmare. So some of you might be losing money in the nursery and making money in the landscape. Be very interesting to find out what's going on in your businesses. Um, sorry, that was average 27 and 39. There's actually companies with like negative gross profit. It's it's uh that's a scary scene. So here's a quick snapshot of a compressed um, operational statistic uh, that I use for landscaping. Sales, green. Cogs, cost of goods, which is labor. Um, there's vehicles, equipment, repairs, insurance, fuel, and licensing. I call that Veriful. Materials and subcontractings. In landscaping, that's, that's going to be your cogs. That gives you your gross profit. Uh, the higher your gross profit, the more room there is to make a net profit. Um, there's your overhead ratio. Sometimes you pay yourselves poorly, poorly, terribly, and it looks like you're making a great net profit, but you're actually subsidizing the business with your own um, wages. So I'd rather a lower profit and a higher pay for yourself uh, as income 
because if you got hit by a bus and you have to replace yourself, that's what the going rate is. So I always like to set the going rate for that position for the wage rates for the, for the staff in the overhead. Um, there's a number of production days. So how many production days do we have? How many crews do we have? And um, at what point do we break even? So how many days, at what point do we actually break even in the season? So we, we have these charts and tools that we use to calculate these for companies to make them realize uh, the difference between one crew and two crew and the length of the season. Makes a huge impact on whether you're going to make a, a good profit. And then also, um, we want to know what your income is and what your ratio to uh, revenue is as, your, as an owner, right? So there's no point working for free. Again, I'd rather have a less profit at, at net profit and pay you more. Here's something that we use to analyze financials. So we go, well, actually, when I get financials, the first thing I do is I color code it. High, wrong location, bad margins, unclear distinction, not the best use of, missing chart of accounts, seems very low, group poorly, duplicate account. I give you some good points for green. And then not needed, an unnecessary chart of account, and then deadly, deadly catchphrases, other and miscellaneous. So when we do financial analysis for companies and we help sort out their books and get them to find the opportunities and, 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 and eliminate the risks, this is how we approach understanding financials. This is sort of a summary compact financial with all the breakouts, but sales, um, we have uh, COGS, we have gross profit, we have net profit. Um, there's also different types of profit. There's operating profit, there's EBITDA, and then there's profit after uh, extraordinary income, which uh, would be 8,000 and 9,000. But essentially you wanna look at your operating profit first because that tells you how well you're running the business. And uh, it's probably too complicated in the hour that I have to get into all those other types of profits. And there's different ratios for gross profits for different types of businesses. Residential design build, residential tender build, residential maintenance, Here's some ratios that we've seen that are good, bad, or medium. Some of the businesses are more uh, difficult than others, and it's much harder to reach a, a high gross profit. So doing design build is generally more profitable than bidding on work um, because the customer is hiring you for who you are as opposed to just your price. And you don't have multiple irrational competitors. So when I look at businesses, I understand which ones are safer, which ones are easier, which ones are harder. Uh, and you know, if somebody sells you, you should make a gross part of X. Well, that's not necessarily true because it's a function of uh, how long your business has been around, how much your premium that you charges for the work, what kind of equipment you have, the type of work that you do, whether it's hand work or machine work. Um, so really, uh, the, 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 the ratios, you can't just go with one ratio. And that's why we've broken it down. We even do commercial uh, tender build and commercial maintenance. And also the size of your business will determine the overhead ratio. The bigger the business, the lower the overhead ratio, the higher the overhead, but the actual percentages go down. So a company with $20 million in sales might only have a 15% overhead ratio. Where a company with $2 million, they might have a 30 or 35% overhead ratio. So all these things determine whether you're competitive or not, and whether you're making money, whether you're paying yourself decently, whether you're waking too many hours, um, I like to look at business from safety first, quality of life second, income third, and net profit fourth. And if you approach the business um, journey that way, then you'll have way less uh, ulcers and uh, heart attacks and nervous breakdowns. So the money's in your company. You can save, you can cut, you can invest, or you can change. Now I'll focus on the change, change your thinking, change preconceived notions, change your buying habits, focus on Kaizen, continual improvement in education, and get coaching. The best companies that I've seen have multiple different coaches. They have leadership coaches. They have sales coaches. Um, sometimes they bring in operations experts. Sometimes they bring in HR experts. But you don't have those skill sets. You need to get them. You can't afford to hire them on the team. You can outsource them. So repeat this process, save, invest, cut, and change. You'll get the best results. And uh, we're almost done. Going fast here. Skip this. There we go. So oops, that, that's it. There we go. So George, um, one, one quick question. 
and it, you were talking about uh, leasing and ownership. Is, is there a, uh, a situation where short-term rental is an option? You know, again, like t typical garden centers, really busy for three months. So, so maybe ownership and leasing are not ideal if you have to maintain that expense for 12 months. And like in, in contracting, do you do that as well? Do you rent sometimes? Absolutely. Short? Yeah. So there's a magic number where it's worth owning. And uh, it's if you're only using it three months of the year or four months of the year, um, you uh, definitely should not buy or lease. There's no question about it. The other thing also is you can do uh, deals if you're good at negotiating tactically with your uh, local um equipment dealer that's that's renting equipment out and you can say listen you know i'm going to pay this much what about a marginal revenue for you for low hours after this period so you can negotiate all kinds of deals that are advantage advantageous to you from a cash flow perspective um and then don't hurt your cash flow uh so that requires some relationships obviously I, I'm, I'm a big believer in great relationships and uh there's a concept in economics called marginal return or mar marginal return and so uh, they're going to get a marginal return that they otherwise wouldn't because the machine would be sitting there anyway they might as well collect some money on it and make it a win-win for you and them and maybe they factor in some extra repair bills or something like whatever but you can you can all you can negotiate all kinds of different rental deals the deal that's in the book is not the deal that you need to make right okay well listen uh george i want to on behalf of the Garden Center sector group, say thanks. Tons of information in here. Uh, it's going to require me to uh, revisit this presentation when it gets distributed again. And uh, clearly, you know, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of emphasis that I think we all need to place on on knowing our numbers as opposed to just bringing in more money. So thank you so much. And uh, lots of parallels between, you know, contractors and retailers. I think you're 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 preaching to the choir, but uh, you know, lots of lots of great stuff. So thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, uh, Art, and uh, everybody. Have a great season. Uh, thank you for um, sitting in. And uh, yeah, finance is heavy, <laughs> and I'll leave yes. it at that. All right. Thanks, George, and Thanks. thank you, everybody. Uh, have a great day. You can all log off and uh, look forward to seeing you in all of the garden centers over the next uh, 120 days. So thanks, everyone. Have a great thanks. day.